Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Nigel Job, and this video podcast is entitled Dealing with Change. And I'm delighted and honoured to be joined by an international expert on that subject, Holger Ratgeber. He's a best selling author who, along with John Cotter, wrote Our Iceberg is Melting and more latterly, that's not how we do it here. As well as an international best-selling author, Holger is also a business consultant with expertise in change, obviously, but also in business transformation and leadership. He has a background in HR and was once vice president of HR for healthcare giant Beckton Dickinson. Holger, great to have you with us. Um, now, the thing to probably kick off on is... Um, this last 12 or 18 months has been a kind of massive period of change uh, for individuals and organisations. So my, my first sort of question really to get the conversation going is, what is it, would you say, about change generally that is challenging for both individuals and also organisations? Well, that's, that's a big one, Nigel. And... Um... And what makes it worse is that generalizations generally don't work well. So we have to look into the situation, the person, the organization to come up with a meaningful assessment or even a recommendation. But yet, um, if you look at everybody who is in their time, I mean, uh, it has been amplified by the whole COVID uh, situation there. But changes all over around you and it's 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 meant there to stay it's not going away so don't fool yourself like oh it will maybe you know things will go back to normal normal is over hmm. so there are two things that are more that are really important on that one is everybody talks about change but there's also something that I, I want to use this opportunity talking to you that we have to start to be aware, conscious, uh, which is what is, is worth to be preserved. Mm -hmm. We're all crazy about change, change, change. But if we give up the things that we are actually relying on, the core, we're not, surfing well. We're not served well. So in these crazy times when everybody talks about change, it's also a good question is what is it worth to fight for, to preserve? But that's the one thing. The other part is that's generally true. So actually generalization works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is when you ask people about kind of what, what's going on in their lives and what they should do about it, and you even do a facilitation job like I sometimes do and you scribble on the flip chart and you know after turning the page four times, here we go, that's the list of what we should do. No one can do should do lists. No one. It's impossible. So unless we understand the dynamics and that's what we have wrote in the Penguin books about the process of change, right? These smart penguins, and without actually really knowing, uh, they went through what we call the eight process, the eight steps of change, or eight accelerators of change. Unless you understand that there's a natural sequence, a pattern, you're exhausting yourself. You should do all sorts of things. A little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there. And it, it doesn't help you, it just exhausts you. Um, so that's what actually uh, is very important. We need is to that, understand is that, that pattern with, is that pattern with change, is that, you know, obviously, you know, at the moment, you know, as this is being recorded, we're still in the problem of the pandemic. You know, is that change kind of following a pattern which is the same for all change, like a recession or, or you know, so I'm talking about things which happen to, because often they're things that happen to people, aren't they? That's how people see change very often. It's something that's happened to me. Would I be right in that? Actually, Nigel, the point is, okay, um, this pandemic is out there and you can do, <clears throat> you as individual, 
is actually very little you can do about it except coping with it yourself and with the, love, the ones you love. And that's a different strategy than if you're in a business and you have a threat or an opportunity with a competition or a technology or whatever. That's very different because your circle of, of where you have influence is much larger, right? I mean, I, it took me six months to get even a bloody vaccination date and I could do nothing about it. <laughs> Because probably I didn't know the right people, but whatever. There was little I could do about it except on coping with it. And, and going back to the old stoic wisdom around, you know, change what you can control, da, 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 and accept what you can't change and know the difference. So in that sense, that example is difficult to judge because there's... There's only so many things we can do, but on an individual base, you, you could clearly see some people taking charge, you know, changing things, adapting things about homeschooling, da da da, home office. And others were just in the whining and moaning and whatever, like how hard life is. Um, but that's an attitude. Mm. Okay. Um, that has nothing to do with the true process of change. But what you could sense is when, when it dawned on people, this is kind of serious stuff. When, we, when the Italian pictures hit us, you know. This is not just a fantasy, that's serious stuff. It drove some behaviors. Um, but again, it's, it's not a perfect example. That's what I'm saying. And what about for those, and this, of course, sadly may be the case for people that are affected and you know it might be a result of the of the crisis and those people who find themselves obviously made redundant as we say in the uk or or, or out of work um you know what what's perhaps the best way for those people would you recommend it's really tough i mean you, well, you and i have been through yeah, that little that little thing you know the the circle of control what can you control i mean you can control what you allow your brain to think. So mm. It's very strange, but you can control that. It's how, how, do you, how do you sort of say, you know, individuals can, you know, see a positive perhaps? If you go in the morning and if you go in front of the, the mirror and you put a toothbrush in your mouth, you can basically say, I'm fucking awesome. I'm awesome. I'm really good. You know, whatever happens out there, I'm good. That's totally your decision to say. And if it doesn't work instantly, meaning uh, your brain fires back and says, well, you're probably not so awesome. You screwed up this and you screwed up that. And, and actually you dropped out of whatever. You know what? Then say it a hundred more times until your brain capitulates and accepts that you are fucking awesome. <laughs> and that's the number one thing. That's the only thing that you can do. See, there's nothing I can help people with who exist in a state of a lack of confidence because the universe will not serve them. They will not come up with the right things or they will not follow through with whatever they say they will do. It starts there. Mm. Just there. And it's not a God-given thing. It's some, for some people it's given. Other people just have to go in front of the mirror and say it a hundred times. Until they, the brain gives up and say, I believe you, come on, stop talking about me like this. Ah, yes, you're awesome. And then move on. <laughs> yes, the power of repetition of actually saying, I mean, I, I've, I've read this. I don't know how true it is in psychology, but if you are, you know, if you're able to keep repeating what you will do and what you are, then you will become it. And, uh, you know, there are some people who are kind of a bit skeptical about that. But I think that there's definitely some truth in it. You're kind of almost tricking the brain into looking for the opportunities to endorse what you're saying, aren't you? Exactly. Uh, you're tricking it and you focus. But suddenly you start to see opportunities that you haven't noticed before in your pessimistic or cynical or whatever mode or your I'm not good stuff. You're not seeing them. They are there, but you have you you're ignoring them, or you're not, or you basically uh, walk away from them. So, I mean, that's the one thing we can hammer that for another two hours. But fundamentally, work on confidence first. Now that has a caveat, Nigel. 
because I work with a lot of executives. And with executive, actually, it's a different story. Because they are only half as smart, attractive, intelligent, like anybody around them wants to tell them that they are. So they have to practice humbleness, yeah, yeah. which is the sister virtue of confidence. That's a total different story. That's why I'm saying these generalizations are hard, are difficult to make without looking in the, per, in the situation. But more often than not, if people are very high up in the organization, their task is to, to learn the sister virtue of humbleness. Mm. And I know that you know what I'm talking about in your job. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I think that, uh, well, I mean, if I'm looking at uh, individuals, either when we've been doing a search and you come across an individual who's got, you know, what would appear to be a perfect profile, um, there are many that have essentially discounted themselves by a lack of humility, particularly for certain cultures and certain organizations. And I would say generally, the more professional an organization, if that's not too trite a word, the more professional the organization, the higher the expectation that individual knows the difference between confidence and overconfidence. And I, and I think that's that's really important. And that can be really difficult for people if they have lost their job. And, and as you say, particularly maybe somebody who's been in a senior role for a long time and, uh, and they lose their position and all of a sudden almost their, you know, their, their life is pulled out from underneath them because that's the thing that occupies most of their time. So, um, so yeah, there's a kind of, a yin and a yang to that, which is kind of neat, isn't it? There's that kind of telling yourself you're awesome, but also telling yourself that actually you need to believe internally that you're awesome, but you also need to come across with a certain amount of humility, I think, is, is perhaps the message there. Well, and again, it starts wherever you start from, you know. Um, I mean, the, the I'm awesome thing is for, actually, it's actually for the majority of people. Um, but But the other part is, I'm only human and or I'm a contribution to something is another part that some people have to learn as well, right? Not to be driven away. But probably one thing, Nigel, I want to I wanna connect with was the long lists, you know, which I find the long list of things that we should do now as we are in the process of change. And, you know, a lot of people don't are not inclined to play the script that we have so carefully written. Why the hell are they not doing what we are, what we wrote for them in the book, you know? Mm. And uh, whatever comes in there. Um, that's actually uh, something that that is at the root of the Penguin story because uh, we, we very often find that um, life has not prepared people to, to cope with that amount of, you know, dynam uh, dynamic activity. And very often they go back to actually what they've learned, meaning planning, change management stuff, and da uh, da And they're missing the point. They're creating too long lists of things they should do. And John's work is amazing in the sense that it mapped out the pattern of how successful transformation happened. and. And, and still happen and it has a sequence meaning I don't have to do everything I I focus on two or three things I need I mean I need to drive in a sense of urgency or as an executive you you know you go to a team and said you know uh, I really count on you and uh, wish you good luck that's not what they say and then they leave the room that's not what they say but that's actually what they mean and not understanding that okay teams is the natural state of things. People like to cooperate, but only to some degree. But a great team is work. You need to do. You need to put in the work to have it. And most fundamentally, what I often find in my practice, Nigel, is that people skip the sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. They just think somehow it will happen. Sometimes you know, once we have this wonderful vision, mission, blah blah blah. Uh, people will line up for it, very often not. 
Very often not. Um, so, uh, and once you understand that, you can start, you can narrow down what you need to focus on, and then your list becomes very powerful. And that's what they do, what our penguins do. So, if any of you haven't actually come across the books, so I'm going to give them a big plug here because I I I, I don't wish to. Um, make Holger feel embarrassed, but uh, they are both excellent uh, books. Holger, um, the um, our iceberg is melting is the one that he's referring to, which is about a well, it's a it's a fable, isn't it? You've turned the the kind of the principles these eight eight, eight principles is eight principles, isn't it? Okay. It's well, some call it eight steps, some call it now accelerators because steps assume it's just one to one and two and three and four but yeah. it's not that so so that the principle the, the the principles are basically put into a fable which is about some penguins who realize that their iceberg or they suspect that their iceberg might be melting so i'm not going to spoil the story it takes a, probably some of us a little bit of a a a while to get your head round talking penguins and and then later talking meerkats in the that's not how we do it here um, I think you can even see a pic, uh, you can see one sitting up now. That is that's your yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that, well, that's, that's a penguin nice. up there. Um, that's uh, the penguin and that's the meerkats. Ah, oh, excellent. Go. Okay, so there they are. Uh, everyone loves meerkats and I uh, love penguins as well. Actually, so great choices. But anyway, you have to get your head around the idea of talking penguins or talking meerkats. But it's a really clever delivery on. What could actually be, you know, for the non-academic type of, you know, practical-minded person, it could be quite a dry subject. But in actual fact, um, these uh, these fables um, that um, Holger and John put together have, uh, have really enabled you to read that really quite quickly. And one of the other things I think I mentioned this to you before, Holger, that I like about them is the fact that you can. They don't take that long to read, and a lot of business books, you know, you almost kind of feel, oh, I, 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 I can quick spin through that bit because I've already got the message, kind of thing. So yeah, so they they are great. So very quickly, um, you know, what would you say, um, Holger, in terms of, you know, the the key message from those, the the, the thing that you think, I mean, it's diff probably difficult to pick out one key message, but what would you say to somebody? Let, let's think about somebody that I referred to earlier, and some of the people that are watching or listening to this may be in this position. What would you say the key message of those books would be to somebody who sadly finds themselves, you know, they've got a job at the moment and they've got they've got to turn things around for them? I mean. Um... Intentionally or not, um, the penguin colony facing this threat and eventually turning it into an opportunity because no one actually wants to read a story where penguins sink and die at the end of the story <laughs> into, into the water, blaming each other for what they've not done. So no one wants to read and needs that story. So it has a happy end. Okay, um, party spoiler, but but that's a. Okay. I thought about your question actually quite a lot and uh, it sounds, I'm almost ashamed it sounds simple but you can't do it alone is the core message of the penguins. Mm. Number one, meaning we have very different characters, we don't have a, a perfect hero figure, you know. Okay, I'm not going into detail but fundamentally um, if you want to impact the lives of others, be it humans or penguins, uh, don't go out there alone. Um, and the art is actually to bring the right characters together. And in our story, you know, it was, it's kind of the Alice, which is kind of probably more the managerial heart wired what is what are we going to do who does what by when <laughs> and a buddy who actually um is mostly concerned how anybody feels like how are you nigel you know that's my mind that's the, the that's the logic that's the question that his brain produces all the time how are you mm. somebody else out there and you got a lewis who probably asked the question where are we going from here you know together not falling apart, you know, and and being worried about and uh, being worried about that question in a sense. But in a way, I think the penguin story is about you can't do it alone. Appreciate what you have around you. 
uh, work through the difference, but follow the process. There's a process in the story. Um, how to move a colony from being almost complacent, you know, we've been living here 400 years, so plus. What the hell are you talking about? These little fissures here and there? No, it's just seasonal, no problem. We'll get over it. So you that's what you're dealing with. Yeah, and that's almost it, you know, like, oh, it, that's a, it's a global message, isn't it? I mean, I'm sure at the time you wrote it, you probably didn't realize in a sense how prescient that was. We didn't, but we had, we had uh, six, eight-year-old kids writing us that that's their favorite book about climate change. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. There's one more thing, but I need to answer. I need to answer the second part of your question: Is what's the one idea in the meerkats? In the that's not how we do it here, and um, and it has to do with um, with understanding the difference between management and leadership. Mm. Sounds abstract. But in reality, um, it's about what are you doing every day? Are you basically giving your energy into activities that are um, making the clan, the Meerkat clan, operate reliably and more or less efficiently? Which has a certain set of activities or and or are you uh, putting your, act, your energy into um, capturing a big opportunity and crisis, you know, like always in our stories. Actually, this is funny, I thought about it. Someone asked me, why does you do your stories always as begin with a crisis? And I said, well, because most of the time changes begin with a crisis. I would wish it starts with a big, a, a person waking up with a big vision, but more often than not, it starts with a crisis. So that's why we have, we have, we started our story with a crisis. So, um, so it's about management and leadership and how both are important and uh, both needed and how they work in a way together. So that's the second story. Yeah, well, very good. Well, that's fantastic, Holger. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to do a, a, a quick summary of some of the um, points that, that Holger's made because I think there are um, there are definitely some really good messages in this this short uh, discussion that we've had, um, which I think are really, uh, really important. Whether you are an individual um, who is experiencing change or maybe you're a leader um, in, um, you know, general leadership, uh, general management or, or perhaps HR, there's a number of key messages, I think, that you can you can take from this. Um, I love one of the points that Holger made, which I've had a long belief in myself, which is change what you can control and accept what you cannot change. And I think that's a really, really key message. And the other message, and this is particularly for those people who've been having a pretty tough time, and there are you know, a lot of people who've been having a tough time, whether it's because of the pandemic or whether it's because of something else. This thing about, I'm awesome, you know, it, it repeat it to yourself but temper it with a bit of humility if you um, if you if you get a little bit ahead of yourself. So uh, say it a hundred times. In fact, uh, uh, Holger suggested so a hundred times. I think I'm going to try that and, um, and and see what happens. So um, and then work on your confidence. You know that that is going to be a really important way of managing yourself out of. You know Holger just referred at the end there to change starts very often with a crisis. So accept that that the, the the change that you're going to have could be a really positive thing even though it probably doesn't feel like it right now so the the crisis whatever it is you're experiencing will drive a change could that could well be a really positive thing for you have a sense of urgency and the or the process i think is a, is another really good message and but the one that I think that really jumped out from all the things, all of the really good pieces of, uh, of wisdom you've come out with, Holger, the thing I, I thought is better than all of them uh, is you can't do it alone. Uh, I, I, think, I think that message, um, because so many of us and, and you know, people like myself who has a, you know, a, a smallish business, you know, there's always that temptation to think, oh, I can do this, I'll do it alone, I'll make that decision, I'll be the great leader, etc. 
but in reality you need people and and that from a uh, you know a, an organizational point of view the the message from uh, not that's not how we do it here of that you know acceptance that you have management and you have leadership and people have to do a bit of both of those uh, but it's also about finding out you know you know where the, the people's strength is but that ability to pull people together and so that even applies to those of you that have found yourself in the unfortunate position of you know being between jobs um that you know it's best if you look to find assistance and help from you know people that you trust and love so that's the message, I think. Uh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Holger. I really thank appreciate you. it. You. it Thanks, it's, Nigel. It's been great, it's as ever. Great. It always is great to talk to you. Um, to thank you so much. You. Like always. Thank you. Thank you for viewing and or listening to this Remtech Talent Management podcast. Our guest was international best-selling author Holger Ratgeber, interviewed by myself, Nigel Job. If you'd like to discuss further please contact us via our LinkedIn accounts. Holger's and John Cotter's books, Our Iceberg is Melting, and That's Not How We Do It Here, can be found on Amazon and at all good booksellers. I hope you enjoy them. I certainly did. Have a great day.